So real quick before I get involved with all the science of the wiring and the problems of the wiring, let me just first start by saying to everybody who's watching this video and it's going to implement my, my advice on how to fix these problems, do not do it the way I'm doing it. I am doing it on a, in a controlled environment on a test bench with an external power supply. Okay. Now the stuff that you see that I have out with me are pretty common. So a lot of guys are going to have an amplifier. That's going to be almost 90% of everybody watching this video. I threw in a capacitor just for a little extra flavor. No reason for really for it to be here. And a regular source head unit. Okay. Back over here, just a couple of power supply filters. There's a ground loop isolator of actually two varieties and a regular ferrite choke noise suppressor. Those, by the way, are your very last option. If all else fails... That and one other trick that I have to share with you, you can use. Okay, but we're going to try to play it by the book. And also notice that I'm using this. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be anything special. But you need to have a multimeter. If you're going to do electronics work, you must own a multimeter. Alright, so if you don't own one, shut the damn video off. Go down to the hardware store. Go buy yourself one. Or buy one for me. Because I could use a sale today. Either way, get yourself a multimeter. Reason why is because you need to use this for two functions. Mostly for one, which is going to be resistance based. Most of the problems that you're going to experience with doing, whether, well, this mostly pertains to car stereo, so we'll just stick to the subject. But any audio system, you're going to find that the problem is usually always comes back to the ground. Okay, grounds are rated in impedance or resistance. That's where our friend the multimeter comes from. Make sure you get one, doesn't have to be fancy. This one right here has the settings for 200 ohms, 2000, which is 2K, 20K, which is 20,000, and 200,000. I mean, come on, who the heck needs that? All right, we're going to be working in the 200 ohm range. Just like in a speaker, because some of you guys that watch this video, you say, well, you know everything about the speakers and series and wiring and parallel and combinations and this and that, but you don't know the first thing about fixing problems electrically. This can be your friend so make sure you have one so in that car which I showed you before earlier on in the video that car has two problems it's got a lot of problems and one is no worse than the other because they both sound horrible I mean your car can be equipped with the absolute top of the line epitome of all car audio equipment ever seen or known by mankind but if you get in there and push down the gas pedal and that thing goes ain't nobody impressed with you or your system and that includes me or your girlfriend, or your buddy, and worst off is yourself because you have to get in that car and drive that thing every day to hear that noise, man. Oh, it drives any man to insane. So now that we got everything, and hopefully, if you took my advice, you went out and got yourself a multimeter. If not, you grabbed your dad's or something else, you dusted it off. Uh, make sure the batteries work and it's efficient. Um, easy, easy way to do it is throw it onto continuity. You know, see if she buzzes out, light comes on, and everything's in order. That's all you need to do. Now, so what we're going to do is, first I'm going to address the electrical problem that was not related to through the RCAs in that car. Okay, so you notice that when I started it up and it already made that noise, even if I were to turn the stereo off, um, it's still making the noise. And that's telling you that your system is off, therefore the... The source unit is not throwing out a remote turn-on to, to trigger the amplifier at that point. At least most most systems are like that. Again, verify it with this, the multimeter. The multimeter always tells you the truth. Simple enough to do. Set it onto DC voltage. Put it onto the power and the, the I'm sorry, the black, the ground, and the red probe is going to go to the blue. See what the voltage is. If it's zero, that means it's off. If it's 12, you know it's on. Simple enough. Now... In that vehicle, that vehicle actually has two separate power supplies, which is not uncommon. You're going to have yellow, which is always going to be the constant 12 volts, which is going to supply power to the clock, the memory for the presets, etc. And you're going to have red, which is going to be the accessory wire in any vehicle, which is going to turn on when you turn the key to the accessory position. Very simple. Now, the way you can do this is you can actually disconnect both the yellow and the red run them both simultaneously out to the battery itself and listen to the system. If the, if the system is, is clean and you're not hearing any noises, 
What that's telling you is that you have a filthy wire you're connected to somewhere in your car. Um, when I say filthy, what that means is that it could be connected at a junction point where it shares a lot of other circuits which could bring a lot of outside interference such as like a turbo, an intercore, a fan, your air conditioner, anything like that. It's not an uncommon thing. Uh, some of those Jap cars that are out there, they really have a good way of screwing you because they make it sound good enough for what they needed to for the stock radio which is a you know whopping five watts a channel it sounds good it rolls out of the dealer gets into your hands and then you get stuck with the problem so let's not say that the, that the car dealers are out for your best interest because that is not the case okay if that was the case you wouldn't be watching this video and I wouldn't have to even make it um, so I, I can't say that that's an uncommon problem I've seen that happen many times um, you can go about fixing that problem either by looking for another accessory wire somewhere in the vehicle, relocating the red to that one. If it wasn't the red and it was actually the yellow, because you're disconnecting them one at a time to see which one is the noisy wire. But for my illustration, let's just say that it's the red, because most of the time, that's what it is anyway. Okay, so you're going to take that, move it over to another accessory circuit that performs and acts the same way. Which you'll find there's many of them in your car. Where they are, it's very simple to find. Look at the back of your fuse panel, find whatever gets triggered by an accessory, move it on over there, make sure it's fused properly, and that's half your problem solved. So for my situation, that is what I've already done outside in the car. I'm not going to go out there because I work in Florida and it's hot as hell today and I don't feel like going back out there. But that problem is solved. Now, as for the, the nasty whining, that cat in the trunk syndrome, or the, I call it the black plague of car audio, is when, the, when you step on your gas and your accelerator, and it goes that is what I find to be intensely irritating. It can drive you crazy. I'm sure that's probably what is going on with you right now. Now, the reason why that's happening, again, it's all going to come back to the ground. Uh, people say that it's best to just go out, buy yourself uh, five of these, a couple of those, plug that in there. It's kind of like taking a pill and making the problem go away, but you're really not fixing the problem. The problem is still there. You're just masking it and making it look better. And again, what, why I said you use these kinds of devices as a last, a last resort is because they really should be treated as such. You know. Now, I'm going to imagine that you're doing this for your own vehicle. I mean, me, myself, in my career, I've done this for tens of thousands of different people that I'll never even see again. So, would it be easy for me to just go ahead and just go throw one of those cheap filters in there, charge them 50 bucks or whatever bucks, and kick them out the door and, and go about my business and treat the next guy the same way? Sure, I could do that. And you could do the same thing in your car. But all these little gadgets and all these little gigors that you put into your system, they're all adding to the problem. You're never fixing it. It's never going to be right. And it could actually sacrifice your sound quality at the end of the day. And that's not good. You don't want that. So... Getting back to the problem. Now, on this unit, this one here is a nice unit. has an auxiliary input and also has three sets of preamp outputs. Okay? None of these components am I going to wire up and connect and actually have them functioning because I don't really need to. Nor would you probably be able to hear the noise because it would be so minute. And such, since this is such a good, clean, controlled environment, everything here is healthy. I have a great, clean power supply. You're not going to ever get this. It would be physically impossible to actually ever get any kind of electrical noise in this system. And that's a pretty cheap power supply. It's a no-name pyramid power supply that I'm using. But in a car, all those things change because you have an alternator in there, you have all kinds of regulators, you have all kinds of motors and switches and just tons of shit in there. So a lot of stuff can go wrong real fast. So what you're going to want to do is get into your vehicle, you're going to want to check your grounds first. How you do that is start at the beginning. This is, this is the head that controls the body. So what you do is, again, grab your multimeter. You're going to want to set it on the lowest setting, which is 200 ohms. Okay. Take one probe. It doesn't matter which one it is. You're going to put it to the ground of your battery. Okay. This I'm just going to use my battery, so I'm going to use this capacitor. Or I could use it here because they're all connected in, 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 uh, in common. Well, actually, I can't because they're right next to each other. So, one to here to ground on the radio, which is shared in common with my amp, and the other one right here on top of my capacitor. And I'm going to get a reading. Let me just move this camera over real quick. Hang on. Okay, that's a little better. Now, like I was saying, 
I have my my source unit, the ground is connected right here in parallel to this amplifier, it's also connected in parallel to this capacitor, and it's also going over to my power supply way yonder over there. So they're all together. So if I take my meter, set it on to resistance, the same setting like I explained, 200, which is the lowest setting, you got to remember that electricity is like people, it follows the path of least resistance, which is a good thing in this case. So one probe to ground here, one to here. I got 5.5 ohms. Believe it or not, people, that's actually not that good. That is not good. From my experience, typically 3 ohms or less is acceptable. Which is interesting to me. I wonder why that is. But nonetheless, this is not a working vehicle, so I don't have to concern myself with this problem. But the moral of the story is this. If you have your radio and you're testing and you're testing it for the resistance on the ground circuit and you're getting say 5.5 ohms now let's just go back to wherever your amplifier is located we're going to do the same thing take one probe ground terminal on the amplifier let's make pretend that this this carpet here is the ground of the car you're going to read that now if this says 7 ohms this has 5.5 ohms go to another component say your capacitor put one to the ground there, another one to the chassis. Now you got nine ohms. You got lots of problems. You, the difference between the impedance or the resistance from this component to that component is called a ground loop. Okay? The more ground loops you have, the more problems you have because it's kind of like compound interest. You have a dollar in the bank, it has three percent, next thing you have a dollar three, now you got a dollar nine, and it just goes down a line. And you just have a tremendous amount of problems. So the right way to fix it is to get all these grounds to be equal, okay? And again, without cheating and going for the, for the old Band-Aid over there, because I know that that would fix it, at least it'll fix half my problem, but still, half will remain, you know? And again, I've seen those things last, work for a little while, and then just start taking a crap again later on down the road. They're weird. I don't, I don't like using them. I don't condone them. Just, I don't. Don't do it. That's my advice. Don't do it. Do it right. Take your time. So the best way you could do it is connect this ground. You can leave it to the stock ground because it's, I'm sure it's a pretty good one. It's on a factory nut or factory bolt at some location. Take that, run it th with your amp kit to the back, ground it here. Make sure this one is grounded to here and make sure you're using appropriate size cable so that way you're not getting signal loss along the line. So the longer your wire is going to go from point A to point B, so to the thickness of the gauge of the, of the wire that's transporting that signal from one place to the other. Sounds like common sense, but nobody does it. All right. So that's pretty much the reason why you're having a problem. That's how you're fixing the problem. Um, and that's really all there is to it.